sunsets, horizons, let's call it frontiers. What's new up ahead of us in education? Next. Today on the show, we have Will Richardson with us. He is co-founder of Educating Modern Learners. He is the author of several books, including Why School, which is uh, Ted Book's top-selling uh, publication. And uh, he is a speaker, instigator, and owner of two teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible, Will. <laughs> I think they're mine. So, you know. <laughs> Are they still teenagers? They are, just barely, but they are, yeah. They're going to be 19 and 17 in August, so grow them really fast. Yeah, very cool. Could does go quickly so boy you've got some great stuff going on um, your TED talk is fantastic thanks uh, you really I love the way that you question what we do in education and you don't just take things for granted um, so uh, why don't you just get us started what are you passionate about right now that's your latest uh, you know just you, you want to get out there to people and and get people thinking twice about that we're doing in education well, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, uh, getting the opportunity to talk with you guys. And, you know, I think that the, the passion that I have right now is pretty much the same passion that I've had really for the last 10 years plus, um, and that is trying to figure out what happens to schools in a world where we have such easy access to information and people and technologies and, you know, it's getting easier by the day. And, um, you know, I'm of the mind that says that there's just no way that schools escape this moment without some radical reshifting and rethinking. So it's, uh, it's that question that drives me. I, I want to know what that looks like. I want to know how that happens. And especially I want to know how that happens with schools that have been around for a long time. I think that what you're seeing is a lot of new schools that are doing some interesting things. But unfortunately, uh, that's not where most of the kids are. <laughs> most of the kids are in schools that have been around for a long, long time. And uh, helping those schools or trying to figure out some paths for those schools to take that can move them to a more modern kind of contemporary idea and practice around learning is, is really what I find fascinating right now. I, I think that uh, it's just such an interesting time. It's such a challenging time. It's very complex. It's not all good, right? But it's really interesting when you, when, if you can step back from it and uh, kind of look at all the shifts that are happening right now. Well, I had a question just to kind of around a concern with this whole factor. And I, I kind of saw when we shifted from our old standards to the Common Core standards, this window, that was almost like the Wild West had opened up and all things were allowed because no one knew what was supposed to exactly be happening. No one had officially printed Common Core on their workbooks yet, right. all that kind of stuff. And now I feel like I, I don't know if it's just me or if this is something that's happening around. And you get to travel and speak with a lot of people. If this window is starting to shut, on this opportunity to kind of like make headway in that reform area or is it still wide open and there's a chance for us to get it and grab at this low-hanging fruit that we can like decide what that is? So I think I'd answer that by saying that uh, you know education is in a house with a lot of windows right now and Common Core was one of them. Um, I think just from a, a general standpoint I think a lot of people for whatever reason, you know, kind of interesting political reasons and whatever else, are becoming a little dissatisfied, disenchanted with the Common Core. And I'm not so sure that it's even the Common Core itself as it is this, this kind of pushback against testing and assessment and um, all the kind of really strange things that we're trying to yeah. measure and, and value <laughs> around that. So I was never a big fan of the Common Core. I saw it more, excuse me, I saw it more as a uh, kind of a money grab, to be honest with you, because those workbook publishers were just chomping at the bit to get a new curriculum that they could create all sorts of more stuff around and, and put out there. Um, you know, I see another window um, as a, a kind of a more progressive approach to reform, one that is really about moving agency over learning to the learner. Right, that it's not so much about our curriculum as it is about kids' interests and passions, that it's not so much about kids becoming learned as it is about kids becoming learners. And um, those two things are very different. Uh, I think that we can build all sorts, and we have built all sorts of efficiencies and practices and traditions around you know, helping kids uh, gain knowledge and be smart and be uh, good test takers. Uh, but I think it's a totally different culture, it's a totally different approach if we're really saying that our goal, our main goal in education 
is to help kids develop as learners because uh, they're not doing that right now in most traditional schools. They're really not. That's not the emphasis. And uh, I think it needs to be. Again, when you when, when you think about kids walking out into a world where they have access to all that stuff, um, if they're waiting to to be told what to learn, when to learn it, how to learn it, how they're going to be assessed on it, they're not going to flourish. Uh, they are not going to be able to compete with those kids or those people who are constantly learning, who have those skills and those literacies and those dispositions to continually learn, continually take advantage of that access. And that just requires, I, I think, a, a, a reframing of what we do. But the interesting thing is that it harkens back 100 years ago to what Dewey was talking about, to what Montessori was talking about, oh. to what Seymour Papert and others have been you know, preaching for a long, long time. And uh, I just don't know that the conditions were right for that type of progressive change 100 years ago, but I think they're absolutely ripe for that kind of discussion now. Uh, I, I don't know how we sustain the traditional model of education any longer. Now, let me play devil's advocate. I, I totally agree that we need to progress and, and move on, but uh, where do we draw the line on the student-centeredness? I'm all about being student-centered, but, you know, my, my fifth graders had absolutely no passion for the American Revolution before they came into my classroom, and I just sent out a whole bunch of kids that absolutely love the American Revolution, sure. and the only reason that they do is because uh, I decided that that's what they needed to learn, and I presented it to them in an engaging way, and so they walked out of my room just experts on the American Revolution, and they're passionate about it now. So is there an age limit? Is there a, I mean, do we balance it with, you need to learn this? I don't care if you don't feel like learning how to spell, you still need to learn it. Is there a balance in there, or do we start phasing away from teacher decision when they get into middle school or high school, or how do we balance that? Well, I think it's an interesting question, and it's a, it's not an easy answer to that, right? Because on some level, those kids are probably lucky to have someone like you who is passionate himself about the American Revolution and can extend that passion to them, you know? And I'm not throwing teachers under the bus when I say that most teachers probably, you know, aren't able to do that or kids don't have that type of an experience in those classrooms. I mean, you know, teachers have to come at this in a lot of different ways, and many places teachers are going to be evaluated and get their salaries based on how well kids do on the test and it's really hard then to um, you know to pursue the things that they might be interested in the ways that you are. Um, having said that, um, you know if, if the goal again if we go back and if the goal is that we want kids to be learners then I think that the way we do that is as much as possible allow them to pursue the things that they're interested in and that they're willing to go deep into and um, try to make sure that we're creating the conditions for them to pursue those things deeply. Um, for some kids, that might be the American Revolution. For other kids, that might be Alcatraz. For other kids, that might be you know Saturn, whatever it is. And I think that one of the limitations that we have on curriculum, and Seymour Papert says this better than anyone, is that you know now that we have access to all of it, now that the American Revolution is everywhere, now that you know chemistry and the periodic table and all that kind of stuff is now everywhere accessible online, um, what billionth of one percent are you going to choose to teach in school, right? What 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 yeah. slice are you going to take now and and somehow stamp it as this is the curriculum that every kid needs? This is I what you need to know. I think it's impossible. I I, th I just think it's impossible. Now, does that mean that we don't teach kids about the American Revolution? No, that doesn't mean that. Does it mean that we don't spend a lot of time helping them become readers and writers and learn some science and all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. But, you know, how much are we teaching kids just in case they need to know it someday? And how, many, how, how, much, are, how much are we teaching kids in curriculum that basically they're never going to use, they're never going to apply? Um, you know, my, my son right now is is uh, is never going to be a mathematician or an engineer or anything that has to do with math or science because he is absolutely dying in calculus class. You know, well, actually, he's not. School ended last week, so now he's happy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> but but who says that my son has to have those four years of math, something that he just really isn't interested in or doesn't have a passion for. And then I know what the next question is, but what if he needs it someday? What if he wants, what if he wakes up five years from now and wants to be an engineer? Well, then he'll learn calculus because he can. If, if he's a learner, if he has a disposition to do it and if he has access to do it, 
you'll learn it if he really wants to pursue that. And it's a different way of thinking about it. I get that. And it's very difficult for people to engage in that conversation because we all have our turf, right? You're not, you're going to fight before you give up the American revolution, right? <laughs> and, and my friends are going to fight before That's they ironic. give up, before they, yeah, right? Uh, my friends are going to fight before they give up Shakespeare and Thoreau, right? right. But yeah, I, I would have to pry Island of the Blue Dolphins out of some people's hands right? <laughs> so, like before so, they would give up teaching. And it's a great book. I'm not knocking the book. I love the book. Yeah. But they, so they've taught really it for 30 years. So. I, was, I mean, I was having a conversation with a woman yesterday, actually, who's an English supervisor, and she goes, but kids need Shakespeare. They really do. You know, they really need to read Shakespeare. And I was like, well, yeah, no, they really don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, do, the, do we want to expose kids to those types of things? Yeah, sure. But look, I want readers. I, I, if, if, you know, it's the same thing as math class, right? If my kid is going to suffer through the, you know, the, the, the sermons of Jonathan Edwards and, you know, all this stuff that really doesn't matter, is he going to come out of that a better reader, wanting to read more, being a more passionate reader? I doubt it. And and today, I think you need to be a passionate reader. You need to be someone who loves to read. So I don't know. It's a hard conversation, you know. And and I don't know where the bucket starts and where the bucket ends when it comes to curriculum. But my sense of it right now is that the bucket is way too big. And especially now that everything that's in the bucket is accessible in a million different places. You know, it's not like it's scarce any longer. So, so well, yeah. I, this this has kind of been my question I've been going on lately. Is uh, so you go down this path, you create a classroom that's built around developing learners, not just the learned, and then you have to communicate what that is to parents, and it looks very different. And so I, I've just been talking to a lot of people about how they would go about that, trying to learn myself. How do you see this different shift, this change in what a classroom looks like? How do you see it communicated to parents? Because that's that's a real challenge. And I know parents want the best for their kids. They love their kids dearly. And, and they believe that maybe if they had a great experience in the past, they love school the way it was. Why change it? But if they had a bad experience in school, they're all for change for the most part. you know. So how do you communicate to those parents that, loved the schooling system and it worked for them and they were able to game it to explaining why this is going to be good for their child now. Well, I, I think there is a compelling case to be made to parents right now that the education system is not preparing their kids for the world they're going to live in. I really do. And I think that parents are open to that. I'm not sure high school parents are. In fact, the schools I work with, we really don't concern ourselves too much with the high school parents because they're on the path and they see the end in sight and, um, you know, it's just like, let's not mess with the recipe at this point. Just get my kid through it and to college or whatever else. Elementary school parents, though, I think that they're having some different conversations because they're reading a lot that says that mm, college degrees maybe aren't as valuable as they used to be and that the future of work is, you thought it was uncertain before, it's really uncertain now. And that it really is about kids being able to navigate problem find, collaborate, you know, those skills. And uh, you read all the research that says employers are just going crazy right now because of the skills gap, right? Because it's kids are coming out with a lot of stuff in their brains, but they can't really do much with it. So, um, look, it's a long-term process, and uh, it's just one piece. Communicating with parents is just one piece of many others in a change process that for most schools, if they undertake it seriously, most of these old schools that have been around for a while, if they undertake it seriously, they're, they're talking about a seven to ten year build, right? You yeah. can't do this overnight. And you have to build the capacity of parents. You have to build the capacity of the board. You have to build the capacity of teachers and community members and others to even sit down and be able to engage in a conversation that is relevant and sustainable for, you know, changing uh, what we do in classrooms. So uh, it's a very, very complex process. It takes all sorts of very uh, unique ingredients. And as an English teacher, I know it's just unique. Unique ingredients, right? Um, and um, it's hard. You know, I tell people, you really, really want to change uh, the lives of kids in terms of their education and schooling in your community, go start a school. It's a hell of a lot easier um, than trying to change it. Um, because uh, the recipe for changing it is is very complex and very difficult. So does this exist anywhere right now? 
Well, there are a couple schools that I think are on the path. Um, okay. You know, the interesting thing is, you know, again, most of the schools that people tout as the examples of this more progressive, inquiry-based, student-centered, learner, um, learner-motivated, or you know, as opposed to knowledge-motivated classrooms or schools, are places like High Tech High, Science Leadership Academy. Uh, and others that have been built for this, right? SLA has been around for 10 years now. High Tech High has been around, I think, for like 15 years. The learning the kids are doing there are amazing. Um, but those places and others like them were built specifically for that. Um, I think there are a couple examples of some some districts that are, are down the path fairly far. Um, I think Springfield, Missouri is one school district that I've visited a number of times where they uh, have a visionary uh, leader um, who has been working really hard to engage people in conversations and, and you know helping them to understand what the circumstances of the moment are and, and how important it is to kind of reframe the work. I think um, CCSD 59 outside of Chicago is another one. Um, and there are many as um, Albemarle down uh, Albemarle, Virginia, where Pam Moran is the superintendent, is doing an amazing job of, of shif shifting not just practice, but importantly, shifting culture. Right, and and that culture piece of it is huge. It, it it's not enough to simply go in and start using technology or say we're going to give kids more choice or whatever. That's got to be part of a larger culture um, where that becomes a consistent experience that kids have from class to class, from year to year, from teacher to teacher. So um, are there a lot of schools out there doing it? No. Is it not, you know, some. But it, again, it's hard. And uh, it's a long-term process. And leadership has to stick around. And you know as well as I do that the uh, average tenure for superintendents in this country is under three years now. So it's a, it's a very, very difficult process. I didn't know that, and that's, uh, it doesn't yeah. surprise me, but uh, that is hard to follow a vision that lasts two and a half years. It's really so, difficult. Well, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh, share all about this. Is there anything that you can kind of paint for us picture-wise that you think will help shift like what's happening? Is this is this still like a? I know you've been talking about this for a long time, yeah. And you wish we were like <laughs> there. <laughs> is well, is this something that you see like a end of the like the light at the end of the tunnel coming? No. Or okay. No, I, 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 I mean I don't I don't see a light yet. Um, I'm more optimistic today than I was even a year ago though because I think people are starting to ask different questions and um, people are digging the tunnel at least. Yeah, they're, they're, the questions and the, and the conversations they're having I think are more re are relevant around it. But I'll, I, you know, if there are any you know school leaders out there listening, I think that the the first thing you have to do on the path to any type of change is to um, just state what do you believe about how kids learn. And, and just figure out what that is, list those principles, and live those principles. Because I wrote a post on my blog the other day, yesterday, that I said you know, something to the effect of that one of the reasons why we need to change is because so much of school practice right now just defies common sense. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't connect to the ways in which we believe that kids learn. You know, We know that they need to have passion, that has to be relevant, that they need an audience, that it has to be, you know, all these different things. Yet we sit them in rows, we give them grades, we do these things that just are totally disconnected from what we believe. So I think, you know, the first step, um, and we do this with, you know, the, the schools that I'm working with, is we sit down and we go, well, what do we believe here about how kids learn? And then how do we begin to live those principles in our practice? And by the way, just last thought on that, that requires no technology, by the way. Right? Yeah. This, that has nothing to do with tech. It has everything to do with sitting down and, and really thinking about learning and, and uh, what kids need to be in terms of learners in the future. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned High Tech High. I didn't visit High Tech High, but I went and visited High Tech Elementary. And yeah. it's not what you think. It's, I mean, I was expecting no. like everything to be technology, but it's not. It's you know the student-centered, project-based, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. All right. Well, uh, that sound needs to <laughs> Someone's at the door. Someone, yeah, I was going to say, someone's at the door. What's, what's that sound mean? <laughs> that your, sound pe your, pizza, your pizza's it's, here. <laughs> it's time to play. It is summer break. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to play a little game with you right now, Will, if you don't mind. Uh, we could talk shop with you all day long. Great stuff. Um, yeah, thank you. 
So since you are the owner of two teenagers, <laughs> and uh, we just celebrated Father's Day, and we thought we'd uh, give you some Father's Day gift questions, okay. and uh, in hopes of having one lucky listener win a prize. And we're going to call this uh, Daddy Doo-Doo. <laughs> Great. <laughs> because these, these gifts are pretty much doo doo. Uh, this, this, this just could be an epic failure right here. I'm just it already <laughs> is. On, on our part. On our part. <laughs> Not on yours. It, it, based on the introduction, it's already failed, yes. Uh, so, Scott, why don't you tell our audience who, who uh, we'll be playing for today? Will Richardson, you'll be competing for <laughs> Shelly Carlisle, an elementary teacher in Lake Elsinore, California. Right. You're able to answer two out of the three questions correctly. Yes, a 66%. Shelly will be awarded a free copy, not only of Will's latest book, but also a download of the ridiculously popular edgy rock band, Rock of the Standards. Two prizes? Wow. Oh, okay. So I'm nervous. That's the first. There's pressure. <laughs> So Will's latest book, From Master Teacher to Master Learner, uh, is that available yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been out for about six months, yeah. Okay. So uh, go check it out on Amazon, I'm sure, and wherever awesome books can be found. Uh, so, yeah, Shelly, you'll win a copy of uh, Will's book and a download of Rockin' the Standards. And so here we go with question number one. There are some very strange Father Day, Father's Day gifts out there these days, and one such gift is a quite... How strange nice. are they? <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. That's for us old guys that remember that yeah, TV show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so... Sorry, what, uh, what One such gift is a quite novel shirt. Which of the following is an actual shirt that you can buy for dear old dad? All right. Is it a... Deodorant free shirt. This shirt features an armpit sack where disposable filters are placed. The fresh pit filters can last for up to 10 days. Or is it B? The car mat play shirt. The back of this lazy man shirt features a race car track design. Lay on the floor and let your little guy zoom his Hot Wheels around your back. <laughs> <laughs> or is it C? The beer QR code shirt. <laughs> this series of Drinking Dad's t-shirts features a QR code on the front of the shirt that brings up Dad's favorite brew. Wear it in the ballpark and the vendors can just scan you or scan your belly and know what you're ordering. <laughs> and no Googling, okay? Wow, no, believe believe not, me. I don't think that would help. I don't even know how I search for that. <laughs> <laughs> None of, or one, of these, one of these is an actual Father's Day <laughs> gift. So is it the deodorant-free shirt, is it the car mat play shirt, or is it the beer QR code shirt? I think I'm going to have to go with B, the car mat shirt. The car mat shirt. Yes. Yes. That is correct. And you get a back massage at the same time. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. So I am they going to... They need socks to... like that, too. <laughs> socks. Okay. I'm going, to I'm going to attempt to show this shirt to you right now. So, oh, my goodness. <laughs> All this... Uh, wow. That's okay. interesting. Yeah. Here's oh, the shirt. Look at that. Very nice. Isn't that yeah, cool? They even good. have one for the little guy to have on his belly. Uh, very good. Matching shirts with father and son. <laughs> so, looks like a fun time, huh? I don't think that'll fit my uh, six foot five, uh, seventeen year old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get matching dad shirts. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. I got to get this to stop. All right. Uh, here we go. Question number two. Which of the following is not an actual Father's Day waffle, waffle iron gift possibility. <laughs> okay, so we're looking the, for the one that's not an actual okay. waffle iron. Is it A? A computer keyboard waffle maker. Type on your food. <laughs> Is it B? <laughs> the Death Star waffle maker. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, Round and shaped like the Death Star. <laughs> or is it C? The awful waffle maker, randomness at its finest. Okay, so those are your three mm. choices. Two of those are, are actual waffle makers, and one of them is not. Uh, so do you think it's the computer keyboard? Do you think it's the Death Star or the awful waffle maker? I'll go with the awful waffle maker. The awful waffle maker. Oh, wow, look at that. Yes. <laughs> 
Boy, you are, I can tell you are a dad. You just know what you're surreal. Well, I have the Death Star and the uh, keyboard one in my closet over here. <laughs> Do you really? No, 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 okay. no, no. <laughs> Not yet. No, the keyboard one, though, that, yeah. <laughs> All right, now let me t give you a little view here. Here is, uh, can you guys see this? The Death Star. There's the Death That's Star. You listening cannot see that. It's yes. actually a picture of the <laughs> waffle makers. And here's the keyboard. That is waffle epic on. right there. Awesome. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Very cool. Today. Very cool. That'd be good for a camping trip or something. You know? <laughs> All right. Now, question number three. Wait, so I've already gotten two. Do I have to suffer through the third question? Yes, or you have to suffer. Absolutely. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Is the bonus question. Okay. Okay. If a cool new tie isn't good enough for your awesome dad, how about buying him a whole suit? Which of these suits can you actually buy for your pappy? Is it A? The suit suit. The design on this suit is perfect for today's lawyer. Small documents with famous court cases make up the stylish print on this perfect Father's Day gift. <laughs> or is it B? Pac-Man suit. Munch away at several Pac-Man and the power pellets decorating this stylish 80s retro suit inspired by the video game that ruled the digital world and took or all my quarters. <laughs> <laughs> or is it C? The fruit suit. That's right. This suit makes a bold, healthy statement. The kiwi comes on... Oh, excuse me. The suit comes in a variety of fruits like pineapple, orange, kiwi, and more. The giant fruit print takes up most of the back of the jacket and extends onto the pants. Organic is available. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Will. Now, you, you're really lucky because uh, you don't have any pressure on this question. But no, that's true. Is um, it the suit suit, the Pac-Man suit, or the fruit suit? I think I've actually seen the Pac-Man suit, so I'm going to go with the suit suit. The suit suit? Wait, oh, the, we're looking for the one that actually is a suit. Oh, the one that is. Okay, uh, then the Pac-Man suit. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me uh, let me show our viewers who are actually watching right now <laughs> what the what the Pac-Man suit looks like. It is the most obnoxious looking suit you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> For all occasions. <laughs> oh my goodness! Can you imagine wearing that? Yeah, prom date. <laughs> Yeah, I like it. If it's, if it's lit up with LEDs, then yes, I can imagine that, Tim. <laughs> oh, that would be cool, yes. Okay. So, Scott, how did Will do today? <laughs> well, good job, Will. You got three out of three correct, and that's good enough to be a winner. Yay. Yay. Woo, congratulations, Will. You've won absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but Shelly, she just won a free download of Rockin' the Standards and your book. So thank you so much for donating that book, and Will, thank you yeah, very buddy. much for coming on today. We really appreciate the wisdom and insight and all that you've been doing for, for years now to try to push us as educators forward. I and, appreciate uh, it. A lot of fun. Yeah, why don't, why don't you uh, let our listeners know how they can connect with you and learn more uh, after the show? Sure. Well, my uh, website is willrichardson.com, and uh, I've been blogging pretty consistently lately, so um, you have always something good to read there, hopefully. Um, and then our other site is modernlearners.com, which is a uh, newsletter site and uh, is uh, going to go under a little bit of a refresh this, uh, this uh, fall. So uh, if you're interested in just curated links and information from around the web that will uh, you know, help you make better decisions and, and uh, think a little bit more outside the box, then that's a great place to start. And I'm WillRich45 on Twitter, so hope to see you there as well. Great, and make sure you check out uh, his blog post from, I believe it was May 2016, about teaching kids to cheat. There you go. You got to read that. Trying, always trying to poke the box there, you know. So I love <laughs> it. I love it. All right, and uh, Scott, you want to talk about Global School Play Day? Yeah. Hey, if you haven't heard about Global School Play Day yet, uh, and you listen to the show regularly, then that's not true. You, I know you've heard about it. If you're listening to the show for the first time. Check out globalschoolplayday.com. It's all about bringing that structured play back to our students so they can use those imaginations, develop empathy, uh, create. Uh, we went from uh, 66,000, I think, the first year to 177,000 students active in this globally 
uh, from year one to year two, we're looking to get up to a half a million kids participating and celebrating unstructured play where you get to watch your kids and they get to learn. So check out globalschoolplayday.com. It's free. All it is is about bringing awareness to communities that that, that unstructured play is a really important part of uh, kids' lives. Excellent. And uh, we'd appreciate any of our listeners that are willing to take a couple of minutes, write us a review on iTunes, follow us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter, and let's engage with each other and talk about what's important for kids in education. Of course, if you don't like the show, uh, you could probably not write us a review. (laughs) (laughs) We'd appreciate that. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks again, Will. Uh, We'd love to have you on again sometime. And thanks for watching. Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad.